Welcome to the ministry of Barefoot Church. I'm Clay Neesmith, the pastor here at Barefoot Church. And man, we hope what you experience here today uh, will encourage you, motivate you, and inspire you in a great, great way. Well, what's going on, everybody? How are you guys doing today? Y'all doing all right? Man, it's an honor to be with you here this morning. I'm Pastor Eddie, and I will be uh, speaking today. Pastor Clay called me up early this week and said, hey, what do you think? And I said, sure, you know, uh, it's been a little bit, so we're going to have some fun today. They're in Georgia visiting Miss Kim's uh, father, and they're doing good, but they just needed, you know, some time away. But here I am, and here you are. And then I love football. Who's with me? I love some football, man. It is the greatest time of the year. I'm telling you, like, especially after last year, you know, and what this year kind of started out as, like, I'm ready for football to be back in action. I mean, we're in full swing. It's awesome. The excitement, right, guys? I mean, the energy, the atmosphere. I'm talking about, you know, the cooler weather that's on the way. It's going to get here soon. I mean, just hanging out in the garage, put the game on, get your boys together. You know, it's my favorite time of year. And as I was preparing for today, all day yesterday, I was telling Alicia, I was like, you know, I gotta, I gotta do my, my research for my message. You know, so I was watching football like all day. Like I gotta do my research, you know, they're cleaning, scrubbing everything, like, like doing all this laundry and junk. And I'm like, yeah, there's a game on. I I I gotta go study. I gotta do, I gotta do my research. I gotta, I gotta get ready. But the thing is, you know, coming from Texas, all right, where football is king, okay, in Texas. I mean, football pays the bills, okay, in Texas. Like, high school football, as I was a high school band director, like, high school football is, like, serious in Texas. But coming to South Carolina, you know, there's some pretty good, there's some decent football around here. Like, there's some pretty good football. I mean, I think our first year, Myrtle Beach High School won the the state title in in their conference. That was pretty awesome. I was like, okay, you know, I didn't really know much about the conferences and all the, and all that, you know, when we first got here. But I was like, okay, that's, that kind of sounds like a big deal. I mean, the state title, North Myrtle Beach went to the state title last year. They didn't, they didn't bring home the W, but that's okay. You know, they, they were at the state title. And then Coastal Carolina, like, that is a legit football team, guys. I mean, they're ranked 16, undefeated, pulled one off again last night. It was a close one, but they pulled it off. See, I was studying. I was doing my research. Um, and then, you know, any South Carolina fans, any USC fans in the house? Yeah? Okay, one guy. <laughs> any Clemson fans in the house today? You know, this is probably Clemson territory. And then you step up to the NFL, and, man, you got... I mean, you got the Cowboys that are always on top. Okay, come on. The trash train has taken off today. But I'm saying there's some good football in the area. And and I mean, in my opinion, football is like the ultimate team sport. It's like the ultimate team sport. I mean, you've got so much strategy, right, skill. Many of you may not realize like how much strategy and planning goes into pulling off an NFL game. Like at the NFL level, like to pull off a game and pull off a W at that level, it takes some serious strategy and skill and planning. You got 11 guys, right, working for one goal to win, right? That's the goal. That, that is the goal in, in the game. Every player has a role, right? Every player knows their function. And, and I was thinking about this, and it's a lot like how God has designed his team to work, right? It's a lot like how God has designed his kingdom to function, right? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever considered the team that God is developing, right, in order to accomplish his amazing purpose For all of humanity, God has a team also, and they've probably got a star on the side of the jersey, but... (laughs) But listen, back to the Cowboys, you know, they're, they're my favorite team. I was indoctrinated into the Cowboy Nation as a young, you know, child. In Texas, it's like, it's like Houston, and then East is like the Texans, and then like every, everybody else is like Cowboy Nation in Texas. That's just, that's just the way it is. But, but here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. This is an organization that is recognizable, right? I mean, love them or hate them. Right? When, when you see this star, you, you know what that means. You, you know what that stands for. And, and when I wear this, 
this star, you, you know what team I'm on, right? Again, love them or hate them, like you know what this is all about. And, and I just, I wonder if the same can be said about you and about me on God's team. I mean, can people recognize what team we're on just by looking at the way that we live our lives? Is is it easy for somebody to identify you and identify me as somebody on God's team, as as a believer, right, as a Christ follower? Is it easy for people to recognize and see that because of the way that we're living out our function and our purpose in life? And, and that's really, that's really what this star comes down to. I mean, this is, this is all about being on this team. And, and what about you and what about me? Can the same be said of you and of me, right? Are we living out our purpose? Are we living out our lives in such a way that everyone can see that we are on team God, right? The one true God, right? The Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, man. Come on, somebody. And I'm fired up today. I am fired up because I love football and I love God and I love when these two meet. Oh, it's so, so good. I'm talking about teamwork today. I'm talking about teamwork today, all right? But his team is the best team, right? God's team is the best team and his players are those who are called so that, everybody say so that, so that we can reflect his glory and his goodness on earth. It's his game plan, man. That's God's game plan. Every team has a game plan. To win. Agree? Every team's got a game plan. You got to have a game plan. And so for our lesson today, I really want to dive into the story of Nehemiah uh, from the Old Testament because, man, this is a great story, not only about like leadership and courage, but it's a great story on teamwork as well. So we're going we're gonna to dive into Nehemiah's story. Nehemiah, you know, is, it's a story of rebuilding, Okay, it's a story of restoration, all right? It's, it's a story of repentance and ultimately, you know, returning to God, right? But, but it's also a story about teamwork, all right? Here's the backstory. Here's the backstory. So in, 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 in this time in history, okay, it is, it is after the, the Babylonian exile, so many of the, of the Jews are coming back to Jerusalem, all right? And it's in ruins, man. The wall around the city is all busted up and broken down, okay? No protection um, as many of these uh, exiles are returning back from Babylon to live in Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah is a guy who, who hears about this, uh, he's working far away, but he hears about everything that's going on, and, and he travels back to Jerusalem with the goal of rebuilding the wall. Like, that's his thing. Like, like he's like, I'm going to go back and rebuild the wall. I'm, I'm just going to go do it. And, and so big, big job, right? Huge job. So Nehemiah hears the news while he's serving the king of Persia as his cupbearer. So let's, let's take a look at what it says in Nehemiah chapter one, okay? If you don't have your Bible today, we'll have it up on the Sky Bible and uh, on the Jumbotron right here behind me. You like that? You see what it did there? Okay, it says in Nehemiah chapter one, it says uh, in verse three, it says, they said to me, things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. So Nehemiah, he hears about this, right? He hears about what's going on. He prays, and then he's led back to Jerusalem to rebuild this wall. And the king of Persia, he hooks him up with everything that he needs. I mean, he's got like safe travel papers, right? He's got his papers. He's got, you know, resources. He's got a crew with him. You know, he's got everything he needs. The king hooked him up and he's on his way back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. And when he arrives, man, he starts out on his game plan. I mean, day one, like he's on it, like he's ready to go. He's, he's starting his strategy, all right? Nehemiah chapter two, check this out. Uh, So I arrived in Jerusalem. Three days later, I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. 
We took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding. After dark, I went out through the valley gate, past the jackal's well, and over to the dung gate to inspect the broken walls and burned gates. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't get through the rubble. It was so busted up that his donkey couldn't even travel over it. So though it was still dark, I went up the Kidron Valley instead, inspecting the wall before I turned back and entered again at the valley gate. So talking about teamwork today, and I want to outline very practically for you three kind of ideas that will help you function better on God's team or on any team, really, for that matter. And the first one is this. You got to understand the game plan. You can write that down if you want to. You got to understand the game plan, right? It sounds so simple. But it's so often overlooked. I mean, the game plan is critical. And it's overlooked, even as we participate on God's team, the game plan is overlooked. You know, we, don't, we oftentimes don't take the time to understand his game plan for life, which is located where? In his word, in the Bible, right? He gave us his game plan. He gave us his strategy. He gave us his Bible, his word inspired, right? And it's our game plan. It's our strategy for winning. It's all there. It's all in there. Have you studied it? Have you taken the time to look through his game plan and study what it is that God has uh, in mind for us? All the players on a team have to study the game plan, right? Right? All the players got to know the game plan. I mean, you got to memorize the playbook. You got to memorize the routes. You got to memorize your signals, right? This is the only way you're going to function on a team. It's the only way you're going to function well is when you memorize or you know the game plan. What about in your marriage, right? Do you have a game plan in your marriage? Or are you winging it? You, you got to have a game plan in your marriage. If, if, if 50% of all marriages fail and end in divorce, why wouldn't we go into it with a plan, why wouldn't we have a strategy for how we're going to win in our marriages? Not win against our spouse, but win alongside our spouse against the enemy who's trying to destroy our marriages, right? Why would we not have a plan, right? What about in, 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 with your kids? Do you have a plan with how you're going to parent? How, how are you going to discipline, right? Do you have a strategy for that? What about in your job, right? What are your job responsibilities? What are your roles at your job? What's the win at your job? What are we working for here at our job? Business owners, you guys understand this big time, right? You got to have a business plan. You got to have a business strategy. Who are we trying to reach, right? What is our product? What is our margin? All of those things are important and it's part of the plan. So plan is critical, and it's so simple for us to understand these in, in the worldly arena, but oftentimes we miss it when we look at the heavenly arena in our spiritual lives. The plan that God has laid out for you and for me, it's right there in his book. And we miss it so much, but it's there. Have you studied it, right? Have you studied it? Nehemiah surveyed the city and the rubble, and he began developing a plan for how they were gonna rebuild it, all right? He wasn't winging it. He wasn't winging it because this is a huge construction operation. This was a big deal. So he couldn't go in there and just kind of wing through it. Like he needed, he needed a plan. And what's your daily plan? Let me ask you that, guys. What's your daily strategy for winning against the enemy, for functioning on God's team? How are you using the tools, all right, that God has given to each and every one of us daily, right, to win? All right, I'm talking about prayer, I'm talking about fasting. I'm talking about your Bible study. I'm talking about your quiet time. I'm talking about your worship. How are we using those tools that God has given us daily to win? I, I can't answer that question for you, but you can answer that question honestly, right? And, and you can determine, what is my plan? Do I have a plan? Am I functioning with that? Am I following the plan? Or am I, or am I kind of going off on my own? Am I going rogue, you know? Am I, am I, am I just freestyling it? They call that in the, in the NFL, you know, when they have the plan, but then they got to kind of make a play. It's like, no, we're not making plays, all right, in the, in the game of, of, of God's kingdom. We're not making plays, right? We're, we're, we're following the plan that's been laid out, okay? We're not freestyling. We are following God's plan plan, all right? So that's number one. Got to have a plan, right? Number two, if, if you're writing things down, everyone has a role. Everyone has a role. On a good team, everyone has a role to play. And Nehemiah knew this. 
And he knew that in order to get the wall finished, everyone was going to need to understand their role and get in the game. So if you study chapter three of Nehemiah, you will see basically that it is listing everybody that helped out on the wall. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's literally what it is. It's like so-and-so fixed this part. And then so-and-so was next to him and they did this part. And so-and-so did this part. And, you know, J- Joe Bob, you know, he did this part, you know, and, and Sally Mae did this part, right? All of these people, and that's, that's chapter three. I'm not gonna bore you with all of that because that's literally what chapter three is all about. But I do wanna highlight a couple of key verses in chapter three so you can get an idea of, of like how everybody participated. It's a big deal. Uh, chapter th- three, verse one. It says, then Eliashib, the high priest, and the other priests started to rebuild at the Sheep Gate. They dedicated it and set up its doors. That's important. They dedicated it, building the wall as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and the Tower of Hananel. Uh, verse 9, it says, Rephiah, son of Hur, the leader of half the district of Jerusalem, was next to them on the wall. So these are some big wig guys. Like these are, these are, these are some, I mean, some important people, right, in the city. Uh, verse 12, uh, Shalom, son of Helohesh, and his daughters repaired the next section, and his daughters, like, He took his daughters to work with him, right? This isn't like, you know, take your child to work day like old school, like we used to do back in elementary school, right? No, this is like, this is like hard, dangerous, like work. And this dude took his daughters with him and said, hey, we're going to work on this piece of the wall right here. He was the leader of the other half of the district of Jerusalem. So another big wig guy took, you know, another big rich guy in the city, took his two snobby daughters with him, and they all worked on the wall together, (laughs) All right, uh, verse 14, okay? The dung gate was repaired by Malkijah, son of Rechab. I bet that was a really crappy job. <laughs> the leader, I've been waiting for that one <laughs> since I read this scripture on Wednesday. Anyway, <clears throat> the leader of uh, Beth uh, uh, Hakarim district. He rebuilt it, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. And then verse 31, uh, Malkijah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the wall as far as the housing for the temple servants and merchants across from the inspection gate. Then he continued as far as the upper room at the corner. Amazing. Amazing, right? Amazing how many people stepped up and stepped in and got their hands dirty right, and got involved with what Nehemiah was trying to do. Like, he got them all involved. It's crazy, man. Like, think about our building project. It's huge. It's huge. I don't know if you've seen, I don't know if you know we're, we're have, we have a building project going on right now. I just want to, let's start, let's start with that. Do you know that we have a building project going on right now? Okay, good. So, in case you didn't know, we got a building project going on. And you can see the progress uh, just over the bridge Incredible progress. I mean, they got, they got a lot of that cleared off already. Um, they're, they're really killing it. But it's a huge project. It's a big project. And so we all have a role to play in that. We all have a role to play, right? But, I mean, obviously, we're, we're not over there, like, driving tractors, okay, right? And we're not necessarily going to be the ones that are, you know, hanging the steel beams when the time comes. But, but are you praying? I mean, are you, have you considered contributing financially? So what we're trying to do there, it, it's, it takes all of us. And, and even beyond that, like as we get closer to the opening, like there, there's definitely going to be some build-out opportunities as we get closer to opening the building. So, you know, let me, I mean, are you, are you willing to swing a hammer? You know what I'm saying? Like paint a wall, right? Hang some TVs. I mean, there's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be done. Even here in this building, right? I mean, we're, we're still here. We got to keep this thing going. Okay, we've got this sucker held up together with duct tape and bubble gum right now. But we got to keep this building going. It's, it's not that bad, but, but, it's, it's, but we got to keep it going. Okay, so let me ask you, have you met Danny? You know, our facilities and environments manager. Do you know Danny? He's got projects every day, things that can be done to keep this place going. I mean, do you know Pastor Richard? Have you met him? He's got all kinds of opportunities for us to get involved in what's going on here. I mean, pastors Ann and Brianna, they've got opportunities in, in kids' world. Are, are, did you know about that, right? Or uh, do you play an instrument? Do you sing? Come on, somebody, right? I mean, are you in a life group? What I'm saying is, is that there are opportunities for you to get involved at every level of the game. The question is, are you doing that? Are you doing that, right? There are no, let me, let me say this, this is my hurt, but there are no bench warmers 
on God's team. There's no bench warmers, man. We have all been called. We've all been called through the Great Commission. Oh, he's going to hit me with the Great Commission. Yeah, we've all been called through that Great Commission, right, to, to go and share the gospel and make disciples. That's what we're called to do. That's what our calling is. People say, I wonder what my calling is as a Christian. This is it. This is our calling, right? Not just to the pastors, not just the church leaders, right? The elders, not just, but it's all of us. We are trying to build a community of believers here at Barefoot Church. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew verses, uh, chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. He says, uh, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh Uh-oh, lost my place here. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the calling that all of us have been given. This is it. This is the role that we have been assigned to play on God's team. Do you understand your role? And I hear this all the time. It's like, you know, man, I I wish I just knew what I was called to do. Make disciples. Share the gospel. That's our calling, the Great Commission. That's what we're called to do. I hear it all the time. You know, yeah, I think I think I feel called to start, you know, the knitting ministry. Or, you know, I feel called to, you know, we're going to have a guys group, man, and we're going we're gonna to barbecue all the time, and we're going to go fishing. And I'm like, okay, that's cool, but, but what about the Great Commission? Because that's what we're called to do, right? That's our calling. Oh, I'm going to start the arts and crafts ministry. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, these are all great things, but, but you, you got to remember the what. The what is the commission. Share the gospel. Teach them make disciples. That's what the what is. Now, the how, then we start getting into a little bit more like, okay, how are we going to do this? And that's when some of these other ministries can come into play. But if we don't have the vision first, if we don't have the vision in front of the how, if we don't have the what in front of the how, that ministry is not going to accomplish what God has set out for all of his people to accomplish, which is to share the gospel, to make disciples, and to teach them to obey all the commands. That is our calling first and foremost, right? Come on, somebody. That's what we're called to do. Well, I just don't really know. Well, I'm going to tell you, the Great Commission is your calling. That's everyone's calling. All right, so we got plan and strategy, right? And then we've got everybody playing a role, right? The the next thing I want to really highlight is that when you're on a team, and you can write this down, when you're on a team, you will face an opponent. You will face an opponent. And that's the whole point, right? I mean, that's the whole point. Like, if you watch NFL Sunday, like, they, 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 they play each other. They, they face their opponents. That's the whole idea, right? You're not just practicing for fun, right? You're practicing so that you can travel over there to the other stadium, and you can whoop the pants off the other team, the enemy, the opponent. That's what we're talking about. Please, Lord Jesus, help the Cowboys whoop the pants off the LA Chargers today, 425 Eastern Standard Time. Thank you. You know what I'm saying? But that's the point, to face an opponent. And in your Christian journey, you will face an opponent. There is an enemy, and his mission in life is to steal, kill, and destroy. As soon as Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem, he's met with opposition. I mean, like immediately, like he just barely got there and he's met with opposition. And there's a whole backstory on this. You can kind of go into this on your own if you want to study like the why, you know, why were these guys so upset with him, blah, blah, blah. But the the, the point is, is that he faced an opponent. Check this out. Nehemiah chapter two. It says, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite officially heard of my arrival, they were very displeased that someone had come to help the people of Israel. So it says here, they were, they were very displeased. It's like, the, the weird thing about some of the Old Testament texts sometimes when it's translated, I, uh, we were talking about this a little bit last week, but it's like, they were very displeased. And, and when I see that, when I read that, I'm like, okay, so, 
Like, so what? Like, I'm, I'm doing my job. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. But these guys were very displeased. So these were uh, Nehemiah's opponents, right? You will face an enemy, and whether you win will be determined by how you deal with that opposition. He faced this opposition, Nehemiah did, multiple times, all right? But his strategy every time was that he stayed focused. Check this out, Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. It says, but when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. Okay, so they went from very displeased to now they're furious, all right? And I'm just like, this is so weird. Like, um, this is so strange. They, made, they all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. So they were very displeased and now they're furious. And, and that's the weird thing about some of these Old Testament texts. It's like when, when it gets translated, it just kind of sounds funky. Like even their insult game was like really, really weird. Like at one point, uh, one of the guys is like, yeah, you know, that wall that you're building, you know, it would fall down if even a fox walked across. It. And I'm like, really? Like, that's your insult game? Like, this is so weak, you know? But this is the way that, that some of this stuff, you know, is, is, uh, is, you know, translated sometimes. And it's a different culture, and it sounds funny to us now, but that's just part of it. So as you're reading through that on your own, just understand that there's some, there's some weirdness there. All right, Nehemiah chapter 6. Check this out. So Sam Ballot and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me, so I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. So it started out, they were very displeased, and then they're furious, and then they're insulting him like, lame insults, and now they're sending messages. I'm like, what are, is this middle school? You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what are we doing here, right? It's just, it's just really weird, but this is, this is the way the story played out. But my question to you is this. Have you ever faced opposition like that? I mean, it just won't stop. Like, it just keeps coming, and it's like, dude, stop it already, and they just kept coming. Four times they sent more messages, but every time Nehemiah was focused on his job, and he was like, I don't got time for you. I'm got, I, got, I got things going on. I'm busy. I'm doing the Lord's work. I don't got time for you, enemy. I don't got time for you, opposition. I don't got time for you, devil. I'm about God's work right now. And let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. How do you handle opposition, right? Do you bend and, and do you sway when the troubles come? I think that's a song. Maybe not. Do you stay focused? Do you stay focused, when the enemy comes, right? Do you, do, you, do you have trouble in your marriage? What's, how do you face that opposition? Are you, do you stay focused or do you, do you allow the emotions of, and the turbulence of, of those day-to-day -day interactions start to, you know, overtake you, right? Trouble with your kids? Or do you stay focused? Do you stay on them? Like, are you, are you, are you about the, the, you know, the end result? With, with my kids, it's like, man, there's, there's some times where it can get really, really frustrating. But I was thinking about this yesterday as I was listening to some radio program. And, and it's not a novel idea that this guy pointed out, but, but it's, it just reminded me, like, man, I, I'm not here to be your friend. Like, I'm your parent. And that is my job first. And I won't back down from what my job first and foremost is. I would love to be your best friend, but you've got to be mature enough to handle that kind of a relationship with your dad first, right? It's like we, trouble in your marriage, trouble in, with your kids. You got to stay focused. You got to stay on it, right? Uh, what about other relationships? Do you, are, how do you handle opposition, right? Nehemiah stayed focused and he stuck to the plan. When opposition came against Nehemiah, he prayed. Number one, he prayed and then he stayed on guard and he stayed focused. These dudes literally, like as they were building the wall, like they had their, they had their swords strapped to their hip, you know, while they were building the wall. And that way, you know, if anybody came, they can be like, you know, watch out, you know, I'm building the wall here or whatever, you know. It's like if you're out gardening, it's like if you're out gardening and picking your tomatoes and you got your, you got your gun on your hip, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, you're ready, you're ready for the environments to come in. You just like, pow, you know, you'll take them out. But that's, that's... That's what this was all about. They were ready and they were on guard. We had a snake in our, in our yard yesterday. Some of y'all may have seen that Instagram post. Oh my Lord. I think it was a racer snake, so nothing to be really worried about, but it was big. It was like super long and it was fast. And I was like, holy moly, there's a snake right there. Um, 
But let me ask you, you know, what do you do when the enemy starts whispering in your ear? How do you fight off those feelings of fear or, or depression or anxiety or stress? You, you've got to stay focused on the win. Your God-given purpose. Nehemiah prayed and he stayed on guard. And in our lives, often that is the prescription. That is the same prescription. Stay in communication with God and stay on guard against the enemy. Now look, I'm not opposed, okay? I'm not saying I'm opposed to medical treatments, okay? I take medication. I take medication for depression. And, and, and I, you know what? I'm not embarrassed about it. I'm not shy about it. You know why? Because I'm living my best life, man. I got a clear head, right? I don't have to worry about that kind of thing. But it's not that alone, it's not the medication alone. It's my relationship with the Lord. It's staying in communication with him and it's staying on guard against the enemy daily with the tools that he's given. I'm talking about prayer, fasting, Bible, his, his word, right? Worship, all of those things. It's a combination of all of those things working together, right? That's gonna get us the win. I've gotta stay in communication with my coach, my God. Because if I don't, if you don't, the loudest voice is always going to be the voice of doubt. If you're not in constant communication with God, the loudest voice will always be uncertainty. It will always be fear, stress, worry, heartache, pain, loneliness, anxiety, right? All of these things that we battle daily. I mean, we battle these things daily. But who's the loudest voice? Who's, whose voice are you listening for above all the crowd noise, right? You see these quarterbacks in the, in, in the game, right? And, and with everything going on between plays, all the action, what are they doing? They're looking at the caller. They're looking at the coach or they're looking at the play caller. They're like, they're focused. I'm focused on the, on the voice that matters right now. I'm not paying attention to anybody's voice right now. I'm listening excuse me, I'm listening to my comms and I'm listening to, uh, I'm watching my play caller and I want to stay focused on what's next. And that's the prescription for our life as well. You've got to stay focused on God. Teamwork, guys, teamwork, it's essential. It is essential. It is how God accomplishes his mission. And it's how God is building his kingdom. Everybody understanding their function Everybody understanding their role, man. And when you understand how teamwork can impact the local church and God's kingdom, man, it will take your faith to a whole new level. I'm telling you guys, I've seen it play out. Trouble in your marriage? Have you started serving? Because couples that serve together, I'm just saying. I've seen it time and time again. Trouble with your kids, your family, dynamic, all of that? Are you involved somehow in, in ministry? Are you on a team? You've got to get in the game. There aren't any bench warmers, and this life is too short to watch things go by. We don't have time for that, man. Have you turned on the news? In a time where the church should be the most unified team on the planet, man, we are, we are really having a hard time right now. And I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. That doesn't matter. What matters is, are we recognizing that we're all wearing the same jerseys? It's like we're running the wrong way on an interception and scoring for the other team. We're on the same team. And when we begin to think with that unity and think with that dynamic of love, right? And acceptance and joy and peace and patience, right? I added a fruit of the Spirit in there, but all of the fruit of the Spirit that's listed in there, man, that's where our win is going to come from as a team. Let me pray for you guys today. Whose team are you on? Are you on God's team? Are you sure about that? Have you repented of your sin and Put your faith in Jesus Christ, who is the only one that can fill the void that you feel in your heart. You might be thinking, man, I'm good. My bills are paid. I got a good job. I got cable TV. I'm watching the game this afternoon. No problem. 
I got gas in my Jeep. But all of those things will fade away. You can't take any of that stuff with you to heaven. I have never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Whose team are you on? Repent. Oftentimes we do it in the form of a prayer, but it's, it's simple. We don't have to overcomplicate it. It's, 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 it's coming to a place where you recognize that you are a sinner and you have messed up and recognizing that Jesus Christ is the only one that can offer forgiveness for that sin and putting your faith in him. And it's not an overnight process. Often it's a lifetime process, but as the Holy Spirit comes into your life and begins to change you into more and more of who he wants to be, we reflect who God has us to be. For those of you that are on God's team, you know, maybe you're like, man, I am on God's team, but I feel like God's calling me to more. I feel like God's calling me to, to, to greater. And I'm here to say, get in the game. I'm, I've, I've come today with a message from the Lord that is simple. Get in the game. Don't stand on the sideline. There are so many opportunities to go to the next level, to go to the next step. And if you're in a place where you're like, I don't know what my next step is, man, we have pastors that would love to help you with that, to sit down and talk to you about what your next step is. You can see me. You can see Pastor Rachel, Pastor Richard, Pastors Ann and Brianna. I mean, we would all love to sit down and talk to you about what those next steps might be. God, we love you. We're grateful for you. We're grateful for your team. We're thankful, God, that you challenge us to grow daily, Lord. We're so grateful, God, for the time that we've had to meet here today. God, I pray over all these folks, if there's even one, Lord, that has put their faith and trust in you this morning. God, we rejoice. We sing hallelujah, God, and we're thankful for that decision. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. We hope you were encouraged, motivated, and inspired today by the message. And again, man, we believe in you. We believe great things for you. It's because of many people's faithful giving that we're able to go out around the world. If you choose to invest in Barefoot Church, just go on over to barefootchurch.com. You can give there. But go out, live your purpose, and be inspired in a great, great way.